Sanctuary Magazine, I suspect he was well ahead of his times. Uh, a former advertising professional who quit to discover his passion for wildlife. He is today quite well known in the conservation circles. And it's a great pleasure for us at North Adar Noon at Taj Bengal to welcome with you. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you, Charles. Thank you. And in conversation with him, he's our well known actor for over to you. So I would just like to ask you, uh, why is a why should a place like the Sundarbans be protected in the first place? Oh Lord, we would need about <laughs> another month of sessions sure to give all know. the reasons, but <coughs> to put it as simply as this, I mean a place like the Sundarbans, yes, if ever somebody wanted to a petri dish to find out how life evolved on Earth, it had to have been some kind of soupy habitat like this, because we all know that all life began in the sea. And today, if you look at the margins of sea and land, that is, you're describing the Sundarbans right now. And the reasons in this modern day and age, at one time, of course, the reasons you, you've heard of Dr. Rai, you've heard of, you know, all, all, the, all the myths and the legends and things, because people knew that something more powerful than themselves existed, and that something gave them food, and that something gave them domicile and protection and all those various things that they worshipped it because they were grateful. But we seem to have, as human beings have evolved into a different kind of, how would you say, space. And today, if you are an economist, I would say to you that uh, the Sundarbans feeds a vast population of human beings on Earth. It's not just human beings in West Bengal or Bangladesh. Because this is, these are the nurseries of the sea, it's one of the finest largest, most active, most vibrant nurseries of the oceans. This is where sharks come, for instance. This is where prawns come. This is where Elish marsh comes. You know, I mean, this is where it's a soup of life. Okay, this is one thing, fish. But has an economist ever sat down and calculated what the value of just the food production of the Sundarbans? No, they calculate the fish production after it's landed. The fish that is consumed is never counted. It doesn't touch your GDP. The guy goes in over there, he eats his fish, millions, not one million, not two, not three, not four, not five. 14, 15 million people directly eat that fish without it going to a market, or rather it's just a trade, it's more or less. So that's one man. If the Sundarbans were magically to vanish, sadly to vanish, Calcutta's economy would be finished. West Bengal's economy would be finished. There would be no economy to speak of. To start with the the force, the sheer force. Isla was a baby. It was a tiny little infant mewling at your door. The type of cyclones that are going to be, be faced by West Bengal and Bangladesh tomorrow are of the kind that would put even the recent um, miseries that North America and Europe have faced to shame. Now, the real value of the Sundarbans, to my mind, in an era of climate change, is that it's a protective, it's a protective armor, and uh, it is possibly a greater carbon sink than the rainforests of the world. Not just the Sundarbans alone. I'm talking about mangroves per se. But think about it. What is carbon? Carbon is all the dead animals and all the dead plants washed down by the Ganga, by the Brahmaputra, and all it comes out over there, and then it settles down. That's carbon. Every time you're dredging, you're putting that carbon back up. Every time you're changing the habitat, you're putting that carbon back up <coughs> and you're causing climate change. So why save the Sundarbans? I would start with the fact that in today's day and age, that it's an economic asset beyond calculation. I would say that without this economic asset, without this ecological asset, the uh, economic foundation of Bengal could actually collapse. India could collapse. And then we can go into so many other reasons. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just so happy when I, I just come back from the Sundarbans yesterday with Rajiv and Rajiv, what should I tell you? When you're on that boat, you know what goes through my mind is, I take a deep breath and I say that somewhere in that mangrove there was a tiger that took a deep breath too and when he exhaled, some of those molecules came directly into my lungs and I feel happy to be alive. That's the real reason to say it's on the one side. So at such a, such a critical time, I would say, how important is a book like The Sundarbans Inheritance? Well, The Sundarbans Inheritance was born 
of the, you can say, an inner desire to present in as justifiable a manner as possible the absolute magic and the value and the worth of a place that seems from time immemorial to be written off as pestilence. If you go back into Canning's times, and if you read some of the, you know, the, the gazetteers that were written there, I mean, the exact words I can't remember, but it is that the, this forest is like a pestilence. No matter how much you try to destroy it, it comes back. The idea was to settle. The idea was to build water canals all the way. Why was it being done? They wanted the trees, they wanted the sal trees, they wanted all these trees to be evacuated from the Sundarbans and they wanted to take them. You know, it was from that day, I mean, from viceroys all the way down to anybody who was anybody who was trying to destroy the Sundarbans and nature was able to resist that because we never had the machines. We never had the technology to truly destroy the Sundarbans. Today, we actually do have that technology. And we can discuss that as we go along, but... Uh, so, uh, you, if I'm not, you have co-written the book with two other uh, authors. Yes. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about them? Sumit Sen, banker, is a banker. And uh, if any of you have heard of, you know, Charles and Mary Lamb, they wrote a book called the Essays, in the Essays of Elia, they wrote about the superannuated man who worked for the East India Company as an accountant. And he loved nature and he loved walking. And then two years before he actually was due to retire, he retired and he did nothing but live in the lap of nature and take walks in the woods. Well, that's, you're describing Sumit Sen. He gave up a very successful, he's one of India's leading bankers and about 10 years ago he gave it up and he is a bird man. He's like a walking encyclopedia for birds. It's not just the birds of the Sundarman. He knows about the birds of this country and his desire is to see that accuracy of bird listing is done because the best way he says to monitor ecological health is to see the presence absence of birds. So he is one of those technically very sound birders and he runs something called Kolkata Bird. The Sundarbans is one of the few places in the world where tigers depend on fish. They do. And it's not that they go out and start throwing a line and hooking fish. It's just that the tide gives them fish. Sometimes the fish are, are left behind in shallow ponds. Sometimes they die and they're lying around over there. And now you think about a boat. You think about a little fishing boat that has gone in at high tide inside the creeks. And now in these narrow creeks where they've got a lot of catch, this guy catches his fish, he can't go out, so he sleeps the night in here and there is this wonderful smell of fish that the tiger just wafts across the forests and calls the tigers from different places. He comes for the fish and this guy gets, uh, he gets up like this and the tiger swaps him one, you know. And that's it. I mean, when the tiger swaps you one, that's it, you know. So it's not man eating always. It's not as though, I mean, I've walked, Pradeep, we walked in the Sundarman, we followed tiger foot, footprints for one kilometer plus on the on the beach where we saw all those beautiful ghost red crabs and the belief that the tiger is such a dangerous animal is born in the Alipur Zoo for children, you know. If he was not dangerous, why is he in jail? After all, criminals are dangerous, that's why they are in jail. They are bad, that's why they are in jail. This powerful animal you put in the jail and you feel all so the myths and the legends, it's not that the tiger doesn't kill people. It does kill people. It's just, it's just one of those things where the people of the Sundarbans, they know that there is no future here. And there is a migration. Pradeep, now here, you, you're, you're closer to this. I would really look at you to, to tell me. There's a migration that's going on. I would say <coughs> maybe 3 to 5% of the people, particularly after Isla, have not come back. But while there's a migration out, in this way, there's a huge migration coming in from Bangladesh. They speak the same language, they speak, they look the same, they do the same. So I don't know, it's like a churn. And I look at this, I read the book, The Hungry Tide, and I love the book, but I think he got a lot of facts wrong, you know. He had said, for instance, millions of people were displaced by a sanctuary. Never ever happened, there were not many millions of people displaced, but the fact is that the Sundarbans, with climate change taking place, 
when there's a three millimeter rise in water married to a 200 kilometer wind, that wave is going to kill people. And when it kills people, it leaves behind, it leaves behind salt because it's seawater. Salt settles, the sun evaporates it, your fields don't have any hope of growing food. The water that you, the freshwater ponds that you made after so much, they get saline. Kidney damage takes place. Ill health takes place. Endocrine disruption takes place because of the amount of pesticides that are being poured into this. It's altogether, <coughs> climate change is being aggravated by the mistaken notion of how powerful we are as human beings. And the Sundarbans is our petri dish. Not a single person in the Sundarbans caused the problem. But they are the first global refugees of climate change. And that will be written about tomorrow. I think we should act today. I say the Sundarbans is a sinking ship. In the wake rains, extra water is going to come and hit them. In the monsoon time, cyclones are going to hit them. And like a sandwich in the middle, these beautiful people upon whom poetry is written and stories are written and books are sold, they're going to be there. Uh, forests and wildlife conservation are all they know is forests. Tigers live there, that's all. So it's it's very unfortunate that my generation has so, such little idea about all of this and I myself am really surprised and little shocked also after talking to you today because there's so much to be scared of and I don't want to frighten you, I just <laughs> want to make you alert and Yes and absolutely that's that's the point. We we uh, the new generation we have to really must do something and we have to get involved in this. And which is why I think this conversation today was really important. And I, I am really, really grateful to all the people who have organized this and who gave me the chance to talk to you today. Not just because you, you are one of my uh, one, one, one of my inspirations when it comes to wildlife conservation. Why, why is it that I love this boy? <laughs> uh, really, really. And, and I have been enlightened today. And I'm sure everybody here has also been enlightened. And it's been absolutely great talking to you, sir. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. Yeah. You probably get asked this often enough. But I have a vested interest too. Any views on wildlife tourism, both pros and cons? What's your take? I, you. He, he well, asked wildlife, wildlife tourism, on pros wildlife and cons. Tourism, the pros and cons. <coughs> In my book, wildlife tourism is a conservation tool quite the same as a gun quite the same as a book. Without wildlife tourism, we have no hope of protecting our wildlife. We have no hope at all. Having said that, a gun can either <coughs> kill, or kill poach, or it can protect. So at this moment of time, if you ask me, is wildlife tourism net net doing more good than bad? I'd say it's doing more bad right now. Because when people like me took the mantle from people like Kailash Sankla 40 years or 35 years ago and we started protecting places like Ranthambore for instance. Um, Pradeep, they were in the Lakarga Chauki. It was the cow herders who lived there. The guards were not allowed to live there. And Lakarga is the place now which is now the prime territory of tigers in Ranthambore. You know? So Lakarga and uh, Berda and Kachida and the lakes. The lakes had rice growing there. Yogi Mile, in front of Yogi Mile, there was rice growing there. You ask why I produced this book? I produced this book because I wanted people to know the truth and I wanted them to fall in love with the Sundarbans. And in this book, you'll find that I also wanted them to understand that as a nation, when we threw the British out, okay, great pride. Churchill had said something then which has come true with a vengeance. He said, these guys will never be able to They'll just fight over things and they'll, they'll destroy whatever systems there were and that's what we see happening. Kejriwal is a product of our own um, inability to deal with something so beautiful. So, I don't know, it's, it's all pretty complicated. But um, I would say that uh, I want you to go to the Sundarbans and have an experience that makes you realize that it's a religious experience to be offered the privilege of sitting down in the silence of the Sundarbans, away from everything else, and seeing a system working for which you did nothing. When we talk about Sundarbans, or any jungles for that matter, uh, there are, let's say Sundarbans right now we are talking about, there are two aspects. One is conservation, 
of the ecology, animals, trees, everything. And the other aspect are the people who earn their livelihood from there, who are living out there, and they, they have a real hard life. <coughs> what has been, I'm, I'm not going into any political buttons, no. but what has been the, uh, uh, the uh, what, uh, the, uh, what has the administration done to improve this or how can the administration more improve this? Do you find any kind of uh, help from them? I know about many forest officers, many DFOs who like live in the forest and they can speak to the animals. They love the, the, they love their forest so much. But there are, they are very few in number, but this has to happen in a big way. What is the administration doing about it? Well, let's get to the first question. What <coughs> about the young guys? I would say that, beta, how old are you? I'm 27. 27. I'm a bit on the lost generation side mm -hmm. still, even though I know 27 is very young. But you talk to the 14, 15, 16 year olds today, and somehow the internet has come down and given them information that climate change is real, protecting is a good idea. And they are a bit disgusted with our generation's behavior. Children don't do what you tell them to do, they do what you do. Now, I feel that uh, maybe it's because I'm, I'm working with a younger lot of people. I think that there's a tidal wave of understanding about the consequences that are taking place. And we are spurring this on. This morning, Pradeep, what I told the children was that go home, your homework is only one, go and talk to your parents, tell them, the tiger. You can't save the tiger without saving the forest. When you save the forest, you save all species. When you save all species, you feed 600 Indian rivers with pure water. In the process, you sequester and store carbon. Now talk to your father, talk to your mother, talk to your friends, do that. It's taking this message home. I think, I think that this is something that will happen for two reasons. One, it's there. It's true. It's, it's right. And I keep telling them that, look, I am honestly from inside the core of me, I'm a good guy, you know. But even if I'm a good guy, trust but verify what I'm saying so that they act from their own in impulse and not from this. So I think the younger generation has got it right and the wheel will turn. And the real reason why I have total faith in this is that nature is a self-repairing machine. The, uh, women's uh, food groups who adopted villages here and sent children to their school and kept the arts and crafts of woven materials still the art alive and I'm very impressed with this for the work that they're doing and the thought came to me as you were as you get this out to the media I'm sure there were people who want to adopt the cylinder bands and be a part of that and form a group and say let's adopt them and do something here together and, and do something for these people. There's many people I'm sure who want to do that. I think that in truth, in truth, what you're saying is something which is not just a good idea, but it's an inevitability. Because if the industrial north, which has the cash surplus, even though it looks like there's joblessness now in America, etc., etc., there's still cash surplus. If that cash surplus were passed on to communities in India who were able to be offered the opportunity to earn a livelihood from the restoration of biodiversity and not be turned into pulleys who take coal, lignite, iron ore or prawns out of a place and destroy their own source. You know, right now they are just being used as vehicles to remove wealth and concentrate it. This is the hard truth fact of life. So when somebody from there would like to adopt somebody here, then I think I think I would love to see people actually come down and and give the the people, the children, medicines, education, all that. But education must also include an, a knowledge of the risk. But if you come down as a Canadian to Bali Island, which is in in the Sundarbans and say that, oh, you know something, there's climate change coming up, you'll be written of a dirty white American coming down over here and confusing our people. You're a horrible person, you know. So there's all these things and it's not going to, it's all, it's all complicated.
not a vision interpreter that my people want this. We don't know what my people want really. You know, if you go down and talk to them, actually they just want to live. And they want to live safely. They want their children not to fall sick. They want the girl child to be given the same rights as the boy child. They want not to be killed by this, you know. And education is a very different than Sundar ones, I don't know. If I, I really look at the Sundarbans as the petri dish for the whole globe. If we are not able to solve the problem, we've been given a chance to solve this problem. We still have time. <coughs> but I think it's less compared to Rantham or otherwise. That's the impression we are getting because there's really very less sighting in Sundarban compared to the other tiger reserves for the parks. Second thing, because there's less sighting, there's no planned tourism as such that you can go, like you go to any of this uh, forest, which is either Kana, Bandhavar, or this thing. And thirdly, you think that it's the number of tigers in Sundarban is more. And what I read somewhere that is, it's only the tigers in the Sundarban in the world who know how to swim. But I have seen in Ranthambore or other places also tigers can easily cross this small lakes and Ranthambore all this Rajabagir in the Machlin or keep crossing these lakes. So is it a myth or because quite a few places, quite a few times in newspaper also the case only Sundarban where tigers are born with this swim thing like he said it's maybe they only have this swimming capacity or something like that. So what's your you want to ask him down over here who's a complete wealth and authority on tigers? <laughs> Say when we talk about the many perhaps we have uh, all heard this word from the Corbett books, yes. which clearly specifies that no tiger is a man-eater, born man-eater, but certain set of conditions turn it into man-eater. Nowadays we are hearing some stories that one tigress is yes. staying near Corbett and yes. all that. But all these definitions on tigers, they get changed when it's a Sundarban tiger. Say, he asked whether Sundarban tiger is man -eater? Answer is yes and no both. How? So this tiger is so intelligent, so intelligent that though it goes out of the forest about 50, 60 times in a year, because there will be always be some tigers who do not have the uh, complete set of tooth or old, they cannot hunt uh, in other areas national park centuries, they get lot of cattle and other things. So inside the park itself, they kill one of the cow or goat or something, so that they can live in their last age of their life. But in Sundarban that is not possible, because no cattle go inside the forest. I tell you there is going to be one, one grown tiger Wonderful, tiger. thank you. There's going to be one very proud husband who goes back and says, I don't just go to the Sundarbans, I look at this beautiful thing. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.